Chapter 5, The Menagerie. Where could they be? Zoe turned to look back at the empty street. They must be in town somewhere, but where are they all hiding? She and Blue had been all over Xanadu, and while they'd found lots of feathers, they hadn't spotted a single griffin cub. Or maybe Dad's right, and they're all out in the wilderness by now. But she knew these cubs. She was sure they'd stayed close to town, close to people, to familiar food, to all the interesting new smells they'd find outside the menagerie. There was a sharp pain at the base of her neck, as if she'd been tensing her shoulders for too long. She tried rolling her head from side to side as they waited for the light to change. Her life was always crazy, but searching for missing griffin cubs was a whole new level of stressful, especially when everyone thought their escape was her fault. Across the street, something drifted along the library steps. Blue, she cried, reaching over to grab his arm. Look! Definitely a feather, he said. It was dark gray-blue, the color of one of the female griffin cubs. She's the one who likes books, Zoe said. She curls up in my lap and lets me read to her. Not a big fan of the crucible, though. That one she tried to eat a couple of times. Really, Blue said. I kind of liked it. Me too, Zoe said, absentmindedly, her mind on the griffin. Come on, let's check inside. They locked their bikes in the bike rack, and Zoe hurried into the library ahead of Blue. The librarians at the desk were calmly stamping books. She could see three little kids playing with the alphabet puzzles in the children's room. An old couple peered at one of the ca computer catalogs together, wearing matching confused frowns. Looks like good news, Blue said, coming up at, behind her. Nobody screaming or running around in a panic. Yay, Zoe said. We're taking photos and uploading them instantly to the internet, Blue added. Okay, wow, I didn't think I could be more anxious, but now I am, said Zoe. Thanks for that. Want to head upstairs, he suggested. No one ever goes into the back corners of the nonfiction section. Maybe she's hiding there. She doesn't like nonfiction, Zoe said. She jabbed her beak right through my history book. And I'm pretty sure Mrs. Novick didn't buy my story about a bald eagle trying to steal it. She sighed. But okay, let's check. Another feather was lying on the second step of the stairs. So the griffin had definitely come inside. Zoe was about to swoop it up when she heard someone purr. Hey, Blue from behind her. She knew that voice way too well. So we grabbed the feather and hid it behind her back as she turned around. Jasmine Sterling stood in the doorway of the teen room with a stack of three books propped on her hip. Her short sleeved white Angora sweater glowed against her skin and her long, long dark hair brushed the top of her skinny jeans. As usual, she wouldn't even look at Zoe. Hey Jasmine, Blue answered. What you reading? The Hunger Games, she said, glancing at her books. Jonathan said I'd like it. Zoe loved the Hunger Games. Six months ago, she and Jasmine would have read it together and then stayed up all night talking about the movie and arguing about who was cuter, Peta or Gail. But when you couldn't be friends with someone anymore and it was your own fault, you didn't get to be sad about all the things you'd never do together now. The stairs trembled under Zoe's sneakers. She backed up against the wall as Jasmine's dad came jogging down, his smile big and toothy, like it was all in all the ads about him running for mayor. Had he seen the feather behind her back? So readers, did you catch all that? It seems like Jasmine and Zoe used to be best friends. Huh, I wasn't expecting that one at all. He stopped on the step above her. Zoe Khan, he said, doing a little finger gun at her. At least he didn't say, we haven't seen you around lately anymore like he had for the first three months. How's your sister, he asked instead, which was nearly as awkward. Enjoying college? He didn't wait for an answer. Jonathan loves it. We can barely get him on the phone between crew practice and acapella rehearsals. Luckily, he runs out of clean laundry every few weeks, so he's home for the weekend. Zoe never knew what to say to Jasmine's parents, so she stuck with her usual response. That's great, Mr. Sterling. 
Dad, Jasmine said, you're being boring. Hello, Blue. Good to see you too. Mr. Sterling looked Blue up and down as though Blue were a new wind energy factory he was thinking of buying. Mr. Sterling owned half the land surrounding Xanadu. He would have owned more if Zoe's grandparents hadn't long ago bought up the acres around the menagerie. She wondered if he knew about Jasmine's crush and if that was why he always looked at Blue funny. Well, he didn't have to worry. After the Ruby Jonathan disaster, Zoe and Blue were forbidden to date anyone. Hmm, I wonder what that's all about. So guys, did you see how much information that we got in this paragraph here? I'm going to reread it because it seems really important. Like we're getting a lot of background information. Hello, Blue. Good to see you too. Mr. Sterling looked Blue up and down as though Blue were a new wind energy factory he was thinking of buying. So like that line makes me think that Mr. Sterling... He has a lot of money and he's always trying to like buy up new companies. And then that kind of confirms it in the next sentence. Mr. Sterling owned half the land surrounding Xanadu. But then this sentence is interesting as well. He would have owned more if Zoe's grandparents hadn't long ago bought up the acres around the menagerie. So Zoe's grandparents own that land. I wonder if that has something to do about why Zoe and Jasmine aren't friends anymore. Going upstairs, Mr. Sterling asked. You two can share our table. He beckoned to Jasmine, who rolled her eyes at Blue. Like, aren't parents so embarrassing? Uh, no thanks, Zoe said. They couldn't prowl around upstairs with Jasmine and her dad watching their every move. And if they found the griffin, then what? Drag it yowling out of the library in front of everyone? They needed a better plan and a Sterling-free zone. You sure, said Mr. Sterling. I just found the weirdest feather up there. I've got a book on wild birds in Wyoming, and I'm going to try to figure out which one it comes from. Dad, Jasmine said, total yawn already. Zoe hoped she didn't look as queasy as she felt. Her phone buzzed. Grateful for the distraction, she crouched down, stuck the feather inside her backpack, and rummaged through it until she found the phone, a hand-me-down from Ruby when she got an iPhone for college. So it seems like Ruby's her sister. The text said, stop panicking. Zoe took a deep breath and glanced at Blue, who had already tucked his phone away again. His face was all innocence as he listened to Jasmine's story about how Marco Jimenez had eaten corn he'd brought from home for lunch today. And wasn't that so weird? Because who didn't like pizza? There was also a text Zoe had missed from her brother. Get home, quick, it said. Apparently, I have no idea how to feed a phoenix with the proper respect. So there's phoenixes here too. Hmm. Zoe deleted the text as fast as she could frowning. Matthew was never careful enough about that stuff. What if someone stole her phone or his? She'd have to delete the outgoing message from his phone later too, since he would never do it even if she reminded him a million times. We gotta go, Blue, she said. But thanks, Mr. Sterling. Good luck with the bird ID, Blue said. Zoe wished she could ever be that casual. He nudged Jasmine. Let me know how the book is. I will, she said, smiling as if he'd asked her to prom. Make sure your parents vote in November, Mr. Sterling beamed at them. Hey, I think I've got some campaign buttons in here. He reached into his jacket pockets. Dad, wouldn't it be easier to just shoot me instead of embarrassing me to death? Jasmine shoved her dad up the stairs ahead of her and fluttered her fingers in a goodbye wave to Blue. Poor Jasmine, Zoe thought as she followed Blue out the door. She knew how long Jasmine had liked Blue, but Blue was exactly that nice to every girl in school. And as far as Zoe knew, he didn't like any of them as more than friends. She stopped by her bike, biting her thumbnail. Should we go back in? She asked Blue. I don't want them to see us looking for the cub. But what if they find her themselves? Or what if she escapes before we get back? Then we'll deal with it, Blue said. Try to bring your freaking out down to an eight. I don't need my best friend going gray before she's 14. 
He punched her shoulder and bent to unlock his bike. Zoe glanced up and saw Jasmine and Mr. Sterling watching them from an upstairs window. They might be thinking about birds and blue right now, but if they knew what was in the library with them, if anyone ever found out, oh, her headache was back worse than ever. Please, if anyone out there is listening, she prayed, please, please help us get those cubs back.